Hey guys, this is Josh and Maggie off screen because she likes being tested, being Hermione. Um, I don't I like know. Jeopardy. You like Jeopardy. I need to start the clock. Okay, so I don't know where the last video let off because I was having so much fun interacting with Maggie and going through these questions for you guys that um, I don't know where it let off. But we're still on question 27, um, and I'm gonna read it. You should inspect wheel bearing seals for leaking tears, twisted axles, or broken leaf springs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The key way to find most of these answers before you have practical knowledge is if you're checking a seal, what would you obviously check? Okay, you might say tears, but mostly when you're looking at seals, you're going to look for leaking. Like many seals on your vehicle, the most likely problem with wheel bearing seals will be leaking. So you should look for moisture around the seal and drops or a puddle underneath it. Question number 28. What can you do at an accident site to help avoid another accident? Would you stay in your vehicle and do nothing until help arrives? Would you have a drink to calm your nerves? No. Would you leave your vehicle, do nothing and get to higher ground? Stop. Sorry. Or would you put out warning devices so people don't run into the accident site? Yes. They can hear you and you're not helping them when you answer before they can think. So just give them a second. Okay. So out of all of those four options, what makes the most sense? Maggie already answered. So let's hear what you think. What's your answer? Well, Okay, if you answered like Maggie did, you are correct. And it's very possible that you're getting these answers as easily as she is. But I like to give you a pause so you can think about it because that's how I was when I was first going through these. Um, put out warning devices so people don't run into the accident site. As a truck driver, it's your job to make sure that people can see your vehicle at an accident scene unless you're injured. Put your warning devices out as quickly as possible to avoid further accidents such as a pileup. And legally, you're responsible for putting them out within 10 minutes of being stopped if you're in an incident where, if you're at a location where you can be hit. That was in the manual. So, it makes sense that that would be the answer. Alright, let's go on to question 29. Why should you cover your cargo? <laughs> to protect individuals from any spilled cargo? To protect your cargo from bad weather, because many states require it, or all of these. This is one of your flashcards. What's the answer? These. Yep. If you answered like Maggie did, you were correct. There are quite a few reasons to cover your cargo, including protecting other people and the cargo itself. In addition, it will help you stay on the right side of the regulations in several states. So it makes perfect sense. Question 30. We're three-fifths of the way through, and there have only been a couple of questionable answers as far as I'm concerned. So this should help you build some confidence. You guys are doing great. Keep going. Which of these is not part of the basic method, excuse me, for shifting up? If I could stop with the heartburn, that would be great. Which of these is not part of the basic method for shifting up? Releasing the clutch? Pushing in the clutch and shifting into higher gear at the same time? Accelerating while plus pressing the clutch and turning toward the driver's side? Releasing the clutch and pressing the accelerator at the same time? She, it's common sense. What the heck would turning to the driver's side have to do with shifting your gears? If you've got to turn to your driver's side as you're shifting in order for it to, you know, work, you've got a problem with your, with your vehicle. You must release the accelerator, push in the clutch, shift to neutral, release the clutch, and let the engine and the gears slow down for the next gear and then push in the clutch and shift into a higher gear at the same time. Then, 
release the clutch and press the accelerator. Acceleration is not involved until the very end and definitely not while pressing the clutch. It's a good way to actually damage some of your gears from what I understand. So that was really good you guys got that right. Alright, here's a good one. Question 31. How many tie downs are required for a 20 foot load? Is it one? Is it three? Is it four? Or is it two? You know this. I want to say two. Yes. Maggie says it's two. Maggie says it's two, and if you did as well, then you're correct. The rule is that you should have one tie down, tie down per 10 feet of cargo, but you've got to have at least two. So even if your cargo was only 10 feet, you would still have to have two. But at 20 feet, you would have two. What is the gross vehicle weight GV dub? The total weight that includes the vehicle towed vehicles and the load? the total weight of a single vehicle and its load, a vehicle's ma maximum weight rating specified by its manufacturer, or all of the above? Nope. All what is the gross vehicle weight, GVW? The total weight of a single vehicle and its load is the correct answer. GVW is the simplest of the vehicle weight explanations, standing for just a single vehicle and the load that it's carrying. During your pre-trip test, when examining hoses with the instructor, you need to look for the location of the dipstick, puddles on the ground, a low windshield washer fluid level, or a phrase in the water pump belt. Exactly. She got this answer strictly from just looking at the words. You're examining hoses. That doesn't have anything to do with a belt. That has nothing to do with your windshield washer level. And that has nothing to do with the dipstick for anything. Your hoses if damaged, would cause what? Leaks. Leaks would cause what? Puddles on the ground. This is something you can easily figure out, even if you're uncertain about what they're asking. During your pre-trip test, when inspecting hoses, you need to look for signs of leaks and cracks, such as puddles on the ground, fluids that are dripping on the underside of the engine or transmission, and check hoses for leaks or problems. So it's very easy to get some of these questions just by reading carefully and going slowly. Which of the following is not something you should check during a trip? Is it your mirrors? Is it your text messages? Is it your tires? Is it your cargo and cargo covers? Your text messages. Durr, that was an easy. You should keep an eye on all of your vehicle's key systems during your trip, such as the instruments, gauges, tires, voltmeter, mirrors, and cargo. Make sure you put your phone away for the entire journey. Unless, of course, your phone is your GPS, and then you can have it mounted, but you still shouldn't be messing with your text messages. Question number 35. We only have 15 to go, and you're still probably having a passing grade if you're following along and answering as... Maggie is, and she hasn't even studied the manual. What is the best way to figure out how many seconds of following distance you have? How do you figure out how many, following di how many seconds of following distance you have? Text a friend and tell them to text you back in 10 seconds and see how long that seemed to take compared to how far you traveled? Wait until a vehicle passes a shadow or a landmark and then count the seconds until you pass it. Wait and use the stopwatch on your phone to try and determine how long before you reach a mile marker after the car in front of you appeared to reach it. Get a quarter closer to the car in front of you and then back off again. 
multiply how long this took you by 4 for following distance. If you have common sense, you're picking the second one. You just wait until that car passes the landmark. Count how long it takes you to reach the landmark after the car in front of you by counting like so. 1, 1,001, 1, 1,002, and you will have your following distance in seconds. All other methods are dangerous and, not, and will not get you a true following distance. Remember, following distance needs to be increased in traffic, bad weather, for heavy vehicles, or at high speeds, or at night. If you can't see, you should be way further behind another car. You don't know what they're going to do. Question 36. If you double your speed, how much more distance will it take to stop? Is it three times as much? Is it four times as much? Is it twice as much? Or is it five times as much? She's grimacing. I would say either double or quadruple. I'm going to say double. Four times as much. If you answer four times as much, if you think about it, they're asking you, and this is how I remember it, they're asking me of double my speed. So, essentially, if they're saying double your speed, how much stopping distance, double the double and you get four. So that's how I remember it, because they're asking me double my speed, and I'm like, if I double two, it's four. So it quadru quadruples my um, my stopping distance. When doubling your speed, your stopping distance increases significantly to almost four times as much as before. For example, increasing your speed from 15 to 30 miles per hour will increase your stopping distance from 46 to 148 feet. Okay. Before transporting a sealed load, you must check a picture of whatever's inside, that you don't exceed gross weight and axle weights, a small sample of whatever it is inside, or all of the above. What was the question again? Before transporting a sealed load, you must check. I feel like it's a gross weight. Again, common it's sense. Load, you're not going to be able to check it, right? Exactly. Um, that's the correct answer. Uh, that you don't exceed gross weight and axle weight limits. And again, out of what they're offering us that we need to check, that's what you're looking for. The right answer out the of best answer. out of your options. Yeah. While you cannot actually inspect sealed loads, it is still your responsibility to ensure that you do not exceed your axle weight limits and your gross weight restrictions, so check them both. What might happen if you swing wide to the left before you turn right? Someone might try to pass you on your right. You might damage your leaf springs. Someone might try to pass you on your left, or all of the above. You're going to process this in your mind. What might happen if you swing wide to the left before you turn right? So if your truck is going this way, but you're getting ready to turn this way, what might happen? Logical. Someone might try and pass you on the right. Exactly. You answered with Maggie. Are. That's your answer. Someone might try to pass you on your right. If you swing wide, a driver might try to pass your your right while you are turning. Instead, make the turn with the rear of your vehicle as close to the curb as possible and turn widely without allowing them room to the right on the right to pass. Because unfortunately, a lot of people assume that you're just not using your turn signal. Can you be using your right turn signal? Well, you should, but I mean like they might not see it. They might think, "Oh, you're turning left when and you put the wrong turn signal on." People do stuff like that, they don't realize. It's four-wheelers, we have to kind of assume that they're dumb. Because when I was a four-wheeler, I was kind of dumb sometimes. I'm just being honest. Okay, question number 39, only 11, we only 11 away from finishing. 
Why is it important to use a helper when backing? And if you read these in your head like this, they almost answer themselves sometimes. Because you are providing a job for someone else. Because you have blind spots. Because people feel more comfortable when you do. Or all of the above. I would say B, but is it all the above? No. No, the other two are ridiculous because other people... You're not going to do something based on what someone else feels. You're going to do what's right because it's right. You're not going to do something because somebody needs a job. You're going to do what's right because it's right. You're asking for a helper. It's important to use a helper when backing because you have blind spots. Using a helper when you are backing is important since you will be dealing with blind spots that you are completely unable to see. Before you start, work out hand signals for stop and go. Whatever they may be, the most important hand signal is stop. You don't want to be a distracted driver, so you. Excuse me, that heartburn though. You don't want to be a distracted driver, so you. Turn off your cell phone until you reach your destination. Have all of your emotionally hard conversations within the first hour of driving. Only meet, read maps on your phone when there are no cars around you. Smoke, eat, and drink during straight portions of the road. You're a responsible driver so you don't do these things? Um. You don't want to be a distracted driver, so you do one of these things. Oh. Well, what was the first thing? First one is turn off your cell phone until you reach your destination. Well, I think it's that, but also I think you said something about your emotionally hard conversations. <laughs> Wasn't it with the... You're not supposed to have them. Oh. You're not supposed to be driving and have emotionally hard conversations. So I was making a joke away. about that, yeah. Tasks that make you a distracted driver always make you distracted, whether you think it's an easy portion of your trip or a straight section of the road. Do not eat, drink, smoke, text, read, or have difficult conversations while driving. Read? Like a map? Yeah. Oh, I'm like, people aren't going to be reading a book while they're driving. You never know, actually. In an ideal situation, turn off your phone and keep it off until you're done driving for the day. Yeah, right. Question 41. Which of the following can you not use a BC fire extinguisher on? Is it wood? Is it electrical fire? Is it grease fire? Or is it gasoline fire? Wood. The BC fire extinguisher is not good for wood and if you answered that like Maggie did then you got it correct a BC a BC fire extinguisher is no use on anything that you can normally use regular water on which includes wood paper and cloth these require an ABC fire extinguisher or just a fire extinguisher the maximum tire tread for front tires is half an inch four thirty seconds of an inch three-eighths of an inch, or one-thirty-second of an inch? Four-thirty-seconds? That's right. The minimum is four-thirty-seconds of an inch depth for tire treads on front tires, and any other tires require at least two-thirty-seconds inch tire tread depth. Now that's on each tread across the tire. Uh, it's also helped me, because I remember that up front for your actual truck, your drive, um, your front tires, they're singles, so they need four. They need more because they're pulling more weight. And your back tires are going to be duals, so they need two thirty second. That's how I. That's what helps me remember that. Question number forty three: Which of the following determines the safe speed for going down a steep downgrade? Is it going to be the steepness of the grade? Is it going to be the road conditions? Is it going to be the total weight of the vehicle and cargo? Or is it going to be all of those? All of them. Oh, sorry. All of the things. <laughs> 
There are several factors that help you decide upon a safe speed for going down a steep downgrade, including its steepness, length, the road and weather conditions, and your vehicle and cargo weight. If you're really fat, go slower. Actually, if you're empty, wouldn't you go slower? Cause it's actually, it's both. Um, on a st okay, so on a steep downgrade, not only are you going to go slower if you're fat because gravity is a thing, but you're also going to go slower if you're empty because then you have less traction and your stopping distance is increased. So it actually kind of makes sense. You're going to go slow no matter what. Really. You're just going to slow it way down for the grade. Uh -huh. there be like a suggested speed too? There is, but a lot of those are actually not correct. Um, it, particularly on a downgrade where there's a curve, you can roll over if you just do the speed that they tell you to. You have to go based on the feel of the truck, and only you are going to know that. Question number 44, we're almost done. You almost have your CDL permit. Not really, but kind of. An anti-lock brake system will shorten your stopping distance, let you drive faster, increase a vehicle's ultimate stopping power, or keep your brakes from locking up when you brake hard. Keep your brakes from locking up? Yes. If you answered like Maggie did, then you got this one right. ABS really only kicks in to save you from overbraking and will not change the way you normally brake. It doesn't stop you from needing to engage in careful braking and defensive driving and is no substitution for good brakes and maintenance. It will, however, save you from having your brakes lock and getting into an accident. ABS allows you to have control. So if your brakes lock up and you're skidding, you have no control over where you're going. You can't steer, your brakes are locked up. You're skidding, you could jackknife. But the ABS kicks in and said, yo, I know you just stomped on your brakes real hard, but I'm going to help you because my little computer senses that your brakes are, that your wheels are about to lock up. Okay. So I'm confused. we're going to go ahead and fix that for you. Why are you confused? I thought ABS was the air brake system. It also means anti-lock brakes. It's not air brakes. It's anti-lock brake system. Not air brakes. Are you really going to Google this? Come for me, little girl. She's going to Google that, but we got the answer right. She did too. Okay, the next question. On wet roads, you should reduce your speed by one half, 60%, one quarter, or one third. What? Babe, if you're going to participate, I need you to listen. On wet roads, you should reduce your speed by one half, sixty percent, one quarter, or one third. Half? One third. When a road is wet, stopping distance is reduced and you should slow your speed by one third. In snow, decrease further to one half your normal speed. On icy roads, you should be slowing to a crawl and getting off the road to install chains on your tires. Ah, here's a good one. This is going to be fun. Which of the following should you do when confronted by an aggressive driver? If you can safely do it, call the police from a cell phone. Ignore rude gestures and refuse to react negatively. Avoid eye contact. Or all of the above. If you answered as Maggie did and you said all of the above... You are correct. When an aggressive driver is trying to confront you, do not give them the confrontation. It's Harvey the train. Do not give them the confrontation that they want. Instead, seek police, peace, and safety. Which of the following is required for a hazardous materials endorsement in Montana? Is it your tax returns for the previous five years? Is it your TSA security threat assessment? Is it two personal references? Or is it all of the above? The personal... I have no idea. <laughs> it's the 
TSA security threat assessment. They're not going to ask you for personal references because anybody could lie for you. And they don't give a crap about your tax returns. They just want to know if your, you know, TSA security threat assessment is good. TSA makes sense to me. I just didn't know if they would actually... If you are attempting to renew your hazmat endorsement, transfer it from another state or add it to your CDL, you must get a full TSA security threat assessment, which includes filling out an application giving TSA time to complete the check and having your fingerprints taken. You can check the Montana DOJ for TSA locations to complete these requirements. Moving on. Question number 48. To help you stay alert and safe while driving, you should roll down your windows to get fresh air. You should have a whiskey to brace yourself. You should avoid medications with warning labels. Or you should drink coffee if you get drowsy. To help you stay alert and safe while driving, you should. If you don't want to play, just let me know so that we're not wasting their time because we've got a few minutes. Are you done? Avoid medication? Yes. If you answered like Maggie and you said avoid medication with warning labels, you are correct. Be careful with medications that warn you they may cause drowsiness. If you have a concern about prescribed medications, speak to your doctor. Do not ever try to make up for sleepiness with coffee, fresh air, or especially alcohol. The only cure for being tired is sleeping until you are rested. Question number 49. This is literally the home stretch. Always try to back toward the driver's side because you can see better watching the, ve watching the vehicle rear out the side window. Your truck will naturally pull toward the driver's side. It's more comfortable for turning your neck or all of the above. You can see better watching the vehicle rear out the side window. If you answered like Maggie did, you are correct. You should always back toward the driver's side because you will be able to see things much more easily. For example, you can keep an eye on the, rear, on the vehicle's rear by viewing it out of your side window. If your truck pulls toward either direction, it needs service. And your next comfort should not affect your safety decision. So true. All right. Question number 50. Are you ready? Are you ready? This one should be easy, actually. The most important hand signal you should agree on with a helper is... Stop! stop go! Faster! Turn up the music! Stop. Stop. If you answered stop, you have common sense. Congratulations. Unfortunately, once an accident happens, you can't take it back. That's why it's absolutely essential that you and your helper have a very clear hand signal for stop so that you'll be able to stop when you're, what you're doing quickly before an accident occurs. So then after you take your test, and no matter what you get right, wrong, or in between, it's going to tell you your percentage, which I got 98% because I think I got one wrong. Yeah, I clicked the wrong thing because I was being dopey. It looks like you've got a real knack for passing CDL practice tests because you just passed this one. I've you, I bet you've got a knack for passing the real test too. So that's all the time we have for this. I hope it helped. Maybe we'll go through another one um, and I'll only read the questions that we haven't covered yet in hopes that maybe that'll help. Um, also maybe um, we'll go back and take a different test um, I know we just did the CDL practice test. Maybe we'll do the CDL general test. Some of these I don't know, um, to be honest. Some of these I I haven't practiced as well, much. Let's try them. So let's come back. Yeah, let's come back with the, the CDL general test. Yeah, let's do that. We'll see you guys in a minute, and maybe Maggie will play along too. She seems to be enjoying it. <laughs> 